Now it's a great personal pleasure to interview uh, one of my real heroes uh, in the world of cricket. Growing up, this guy was uh, was part of a team that changed the lives of so many youngsters growing up, uh, not only in the UK, but across the world. So it is an absolute pleasure to welcome to 98 Not Out, Mr. Gordon Greenwich. Gordon, so great to see you. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, the, you, you spoke about the, the times have gone by. Yes, we had a good um, bunch of teams, a, a fairly reasonable team <laughs> that, we, that became successful. Unbeaten in Sorry. 15 years in Test Series. I think that's the, st the statistic, is it? Round about there somewhere, yes. Um, apparently, it's been, uh, well, it still is, the longest reigning um, team success. In, in any sport so yes that uh, I will take that accolade anytime <laughs> and that's because because of um, those persons who were involved at the time were pretty attuned to their job and so on and very committed yeah um, and um, although people would say well uh, you were all from different parts of the Caribbean different islands um, you know the different cultural sort of um, behavior and so on. We we seem to have to, to at that time to gel very well together, and in in recent times that's been part and parcel of many a conversations. Why this present group don't play like that? Yeah. Oh, so I can't tell you the reason. I am not there, and in in honesty. I don't think I want to be there too because I don't see the type of attitude and behavior um, going on uh, and that would so actually sort of encourage me to want to be there, unfortunately. Yeah. So let, let, let me take you back to a young, a young boy uh, growing up in Barbados and uh, St. Peter, which I know very, very well. That's a lovely part of the island. Um, what is it about Barbados? It's a tiny place, 14 miles wide, 21 miles long. But this rich heritage of outstanding cricketers, uh, is it something in the sugar cane? I think you forgot something there and a hell of a big smile. <laughs> and yeah. um, a little clarity there. I was in Barbados until I was about 15. That's when I came to England and joined my mother. So one could say that my cricket was really... Uh, enhance uh, from up here, um, playing in various clubs and so on. And then when I joined Hampshire, so basically it it really sort of a jump start um, when I came up to England. How was it arriving in England for a, for a young Bajan? Quite frightening, actually, yeah. because it was less than the, uh, the left, latter part of the year uh, when I came. So then uh, having to experience snow and so on, you... <sighs> Went and played in the snow, something that was very strange to you. But um, yeah, it was it was discomforting to start with. But you know, you got to like it because I say as much as you possibly could because you went out in your train and you had fun in the snow as well too. So I, I think you had to get acclimatized and grow up very quickly. And you uh, you got so you got into the Hampshire side as a youngster and uh, taken under the wing, I believe of. Um, not Viv Richards, but Barry Richards as a young lad. Um, and, and lots of people talk about Barry in glowing terms, but what was it like for you at that stage of your career to play alongside a man like that? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I went down to Hampshire uh, from, from Reading at the age of 18. So I was, um, well, well, as they say then, on the ground staff. Most, most of the, uh, the little jobs and so on you, you did, um, and one, one, of, one of the jobs that was, was part of it was helping to prepare the, the practice next for the first team. And hopefully you got a, you got a hit after that, but that was, that was part of your job and uh, working on the ground staff. And well, Barry, Barry, Barry is not a very talkative person, but, but, but obviously he, if you, if you were in a conversation, then he will, he will converse with you. But, um, in the beginning, it was more or less, be, I was more or less being tutored by, you know, people like Roy Marshall, uh, Danny Livingston, and 
after that, uh, apart from Barry, uh, John Holder. And um, it wasn't until I actually got into the first team in, I think it was 72, that the partnership and the relationship between myself and Barry became established. As I said, I didn't have a lot of conversations with Barry. Midweek conversations, yes, but of course those are just a few seconds and so on, but off the field, there wasn't a great deal of that. Um, although we did speak about various things and development in cricket and things like that and your own game, um, I did get a few pointers and so on about what is expected and what they should and should not do. But um, yeah, I think I probably missed a great deal in that he, he was, he didn't actually sort of, we didn't have that sort of rapport, so to speak, where we spoke in depth of my game and the development of my game. So yeah, the partnership was, was great. I was very happy to watch them at the other end and learn from what I saw and then try to put that into my own, my own game. So that was uh, a lot of it was from um, lear learning from the visual part of what I saw from him and then transferring that into my own game to sort of uh, develop my, my game for me because we're two different players altogether. Barry, Barry was, um, was more of a classic sort of time of the ball and my way of playing more, was more like trying to hit the ball which in a way it worked, but at times it was my own downfall, but that happens. So whiz forward a couple of years from that. So you're, you're at Hampshire and then you hit the international stage with the West Indies. Uh, and for me, what I think was the kind of the birth of that great side was that 75 tour down to Australia, um, which was a big learning curve, I think, for you guys. Uh, and uh, Clive Lord, I've read since, has said that that was what gave him the the desire to to, to basically flex muscles and uh, and turn the side around. What what was it like being there and facing Lillian Thompson and these guys? Well, personally, I didn't have a good tour. I mean, I had a very a very bad tour. We didn't perform very well, and um, as a young team traveling to Australia for the first time. Um, Australia had a very seasoned uh, group of players who were in the mix for a long time. And it, it was a learning curve for us as well, too. Um, during that tour, you know, a lot of things happened that made us realize that, okay, you may be a good bunch of players, but there's a great deal more you still need to do in order if, if you're going to be successful. And that tour probably woke us up. It was perhaps good that it happened then because it woke us up for the future. Um, as you said, what, what Clive Lloyd said, I, did, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear that from him, but I know many things he said in that this will not happen again. I mean, this should not happen again to this team because it was too good a team for that to happen to. But as I said, Australia were clinical. They were professional. They were seasoned players, and we, we soon, soon found ourselves at the, at the, the end of, of, of the addition out, a thrashing of 5-1, and we, we were determined not to let that happen anymore. So we all spoke about what happened, and we all were very, very um, disappointed in, 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 in that tour of Australia in 1975. And, but said we, we learned very quickly from that we had to um for us to have labored on the defeat which was very bitter um would have meant that you know perhaps there might have been no coming back from there but we learned very quickly from that tour and as i said we we watched what was happening we realized and understood that we were, we were not the, the team to, to compete against Australia at that time because of Australia's strength. And we had to go away and think very carefully of where we wanted to be. And 
as a team and who we wanted to be as individuals. Now, myself as an opening batsman, I mean, I had a, a, a torrid time on that tour and I needed to start rethinking my, my own way of, of playing um, because I couldn't see myself batting in any other position other than being an opener. I wanted to do that. I enjoyed being there. But in the beginning, especially on that tour, it, it, it wasn't a very pleasant. My art tour uh, was 1974-75 um, to India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. That was the first tour that most of us had gone on. And then it was the Australian tour in 75, 76. Tough. So, oh, yeah, but although the India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka tour was a learning curve as well for us, I thought we did pretty well against... Um, in particular at the start of India, where, I mean, they had four of the world's best spinners. And when you go into the test match and you had to face those, you know you, know you were up against it. It was like in the, the reverse where the West Indies were the four fast bowlers and India were four spinners. Yeah. It, it, it meant that your game needed to take a different direction as well too. But what I, what I have to say is that we learned very quickly from what happened on that tour from India in 74, 75, and on that tour to Australia in 75, 76. So that's probably gave us um, a better understanding of what we were all about, the team we had, the group of players that were there, and what was needed in order to be successful. Yeah, and, and uh, you arrived in England in 76, and that, that, that was a famous tour, but... Um, it was the first time that we'd seen your opening partnership with Mr. Desmond Haynes, the great Desi. You two, for years and years and years, just seemed to have this understanding and so hard to get out. Ian Botham tells me a story about spending all day, you know, coming out opening first day, you're batting, and him and Bob Willis and the others are trying so hard to get a wicket, and they get a wicket, and they get, eventually they get one. And then looking back at the steps, down come the steps, chewing his gum and walking with his shoulders is Mr. Vivi Richards. No, it wasn't, wasn't about it, was he? <laughs> well, tell, tell me about your, your, your batting partnership with, 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 with Desmond Haynes. It was a joy to watch you two in full flow. I think perhaps what was, what was good about that is because we both played and opened for Barbados. So it didn't take long for understanding a relationship to build there because you got the feel of each other and how the two of you would go into would, would, would sort of would gel together as, as a team as a partnership and then I think we had more discussion as, as players together than, than anything else as you mentioned about Barry before but with Desmond we had not, not necessarily a lot of off the field other than when, when the team come together or even when we were in Barbados playing for our respective teams or club teams or participation in games there. But during the West Indies camp, we had more conversation, more discussion about cricket. I mean, all of us did, but the partnership of, um, that we had that was developed through mutual understanding and respect for each other. Desmond probably started his career perhaps very similar in the mode that I was in at my start as well, in that he loved to hit the ball. Yeah. But in a way, he was, he was more, he was a little more cautious than, than I was. I yeah. would probably throw caution to the wind more than he would. And we understood that for the partnership to to get better, uh, if you know, if one is going in is, is playing in that mode, the other didn't have to. And what was good is that we were able to rotate the strike often, not having one being stuck at one end. And <clears throat> if that happened, we would try to change the position so that who was playing better or felt better would take most of that bowler and the other person would, would take a back seat for the moment. 
Mm -hmm. So you, you form that understanding and relationship due to the fact that you, you let the other take the initiative and you wait until, you know, such time as you felt a more comfortable in what you were doing. I mean, it was, yeah, successful for so many years. Um, my favourite innings of yours was uh, at Lords in 84, when at the start of the game, after day one, England seemed to think we got a chance here. They had the upper hand, but uh, you had other ideas. And uh, was it 214 that you scored in that game? Yes. <laughs> and an incredible, incredible innings. And I watched it recently. I watched some highlights of it. They showed it on the BBC here. Lords looking very different with lots of West Indies fans sat around the boundary fence. And every time you're cracking the ball uh, for a four or a six, there are really excited fans fielding the ball, bringing it back and jumping up and down. Um, it's kind of a shame those days are gone where you get that kind of participation from the fans. But for, for you playing that role in turning the game around, what was going through your mind uh, when you were batting? Uh, excited fans indeed, but... Um, I think they were they were pretty vicious as well too because um, I can remember um, if it was at the Oval I think we weren't we weren't doing so well. This is the I mean the first day or on that particular day we weren't doing so well and some of the fans they actually pelted our bus. <laughs> That's serious. I mean, no. <laughs> it was good to obviously play in, in front of a. A crowd that was very enthusiastic and um, very supportive of of the West Indies team, but you know, like, like when you did, you didn't have a good day, and you're feeling down, and then they they just cemented that ill feeling by throwing fruit and stones at the bus. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, that wasn't a plan thing on that day. We we knew we had an uphill task. And we didn't we didn't have a lot of discussion or lengthy discussion as to how we were going to go after the runs because it was a tall order on the last day, and we we knew the situation because both and both would had had a good first innings, and it was always the case where you knew that if you come in and take a couple of wickets, it then obviously it um, you don't shut up shop so to speak, but you will try and see whether or not you can get close to the, the, the total. And unfortunately, Desi got run out uh, early and Larry Gones came in and, um, well, everyone, well, that's not everyone, but knowing Larry, Larry is a very stodgy player. Um, there are times where Larry played a cover drive and Actually, Midwicket had to chase it because it be off the inside, in, in, the, in the part of the bat, not the inside edge, the inner part of the bat, and went to a wide midwicket or, long, or left of uh, mid on. So he was a very, he was a strange type of player, but to complement what he did, you know, you don't, he, he's one of those players who definitely don't actually give, away, give his wicket up. You have to fight for it. Yeah, and that perhaps was the partnership or the the partner that I needed because I prefer to play my game the way I wanted to play it. But then at the other end, you had someone there who who would instill that stability yeah. in the partnership. So it, it worked. It worked for us. But as I said, we didn't have a lengthy discussion as to how we would go about the two hundred, the three hundred and thirty runs. It just came about because of how we played and how we attacked the situation. Some say England didn't bowl very well, but did they bowl all that well in the first innings? But we got out. So, you know, not a lot of credit in a way was given to the West Indies team for that. They said the West Indies team won and they won in grand style, but I think the manner and how we did it um, needs to be looked at a great deal more and complimented because you, you don't you don't score 330 runs in just over two and a bit session yeah yeah that heard of i mean if a team scored 
200 in a day in a test match back then. They did a, did a great job. But we, we had some time before lunch on that last day and then two sessions after that. We still had time at the conclusion of the game in the last session as well too. So those runs came in, in, in rapid fashion. And I said, the rest is, is history now, but looking back on it, I mean, it's, you can't really go back and say, well, we spoke about how we can do this. We did this and we did that and we executed it well. It happened because I think because we were able and courageous enough to challenge that total in such a short time. No, oh, it was amazing. I could, I could watch that session of cricket or those, you know, again and again and again, because it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. Tell me, um, so we know about the West Indies batting and we've talked, you mentioned briefly about the bowling. Now, that bowling attack was something else. But what I'm curious as to you and uh, the other batsmen at the training camps, when you're in the nets facing Holding, Marshall, Garner, Patrick Patterson, who was the one that you thought this guy's going to test me the most? Who was the one that you didn't like facing? Well, first of all, I thought it was a very ordinary attack, actually. <laughs> Is that the honest truth? I don't have a lot of love for my bowlers because they gave me a terrible time in the nets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I dislike them as much as opposition batsmen, but they, they, they all try their best. And I know what, what was good was to get back at some of our bowlers when they have their turn to have a knock. That we were going, we would go for a new ball out of the box and bowl at them. <laughs> but um, uh, I, don't, I don't think they were as worried when we bowl at them as to, you know, as we were when they bowl at us because they didn't let up. We had the challenge just as opposition batsmen because for some crazy reason, we also had batsmen who will rile up the bowlers, who would get on their skin as well too. And it was like what they say was bragging rights. When the batsmen sort of um, get after the bowlers and, and then start to get under their skin, you really see, you only see the, the anger and the viciousness in some of the bowlers. And that didn't help much sometimes because sometimes you want to knock and you weren't playing very well and you wanted to try and hit the ball and feed the ball in the middle of the bat. But we had bowlers who didn't care a great deal about that. Yes, they, they spoke about what they saw and perhaps what the great thing about it is that if they felt and saw the way you were playing and felt that you were not getting out of the ball enough or you're not going back enough or you're not coming across the crease to play the ball, they will tell you and they will bowl to that effect. So you, they were, as, as much as they were giving you a hard time, they were still practicing you, which was great. Mm. You know, they observed that this wasn't happening and perhaps this is one of the reasons or the reason why you're not doing so well. And they would help you by telling you I'm bowling in that arc so that you can make the adjustment. And as I said, even though, you know, they, 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 they give you, they punish you sometimes, but they were helpful in other, in other ways where um, observing what was happening with your own game and bowling to assist you to, to improve on, on your game. One of the other things I wanted to ask was, I know time to change, but of that team, that era that you're talking about, pretty much everyone came and played county cricket in England, which you don't see so much anymore. Everyone comes and plays T20 or whatever, but I don't see as many West Indians in English cricket as I want. Have you got any sort of thoughts on how good that was at the time and if it could be brought back or, you know, why things have changed so much? Well, they changed the rules, didn't they? They guys couldn't play in the league because of this. You had to be um, I don't care exactly what the rules are, but it changed the rules. Yeah, so many yeah. come I mean, playing the Lancashire League and, and places like that because of the rule, the change, the changing of the rules. And the county games, yes, gave a lot of players um, a, a good foundation where for day in, day out, you play on different tracks and so on. I mean, remember, we even play had the year, uh, the year where you played on uncovered pitches and 
although you know you you would you look at the pitch and just you wonder well how how how's it going to play or how are you going to perform all these these changes and so on help you to develop your game or you had to make adjustments all along the way and if you think of playing in the leagues where you play a match on a saturday and you know the, the pitch is so soft that when the ball hit the pitch there's more mud on your bat than <laughs> ball mark yeah because it really took the piece out and they expected you to perform regardless I mean, you played in drizzle from the start of the game to the finish. And uh, these, all these things players warm to and welcome after a while. I was thinking that coming from the Caribbean, um, they didn't find it so easy. But I think afterwards they, they got into it. And that was a big disappointment for most of those players, I, I would think. It would have been for me. I had the opportunity to play in the Lancashire League as well, too, for Leyland um, back then a couple of seasons, a very enjoyable and a very enjoyable bunch of people as well, too. Um, but those guys who played at um, Bay Cup, Little Borough and all those places so for, for years and so on um, would have felt very, very unsure at the beginning, but playing that type of cricket in those conditions hardened those players for the future. And I don't think that you will hear any disappointments from those guys who actually had the, the opportunity and the pleasure to play in the league at all. Some of them played for years and went back and played for the same club, as a matter of fact, because not just that they did well, because they, they wanted to play longer and so on. And the county scenes, um, when they did play, enjoy that as well too. I was disappointed when, you know, you couldn't get uh, players up to play in the county matches and so on. But then you look back and say, well, maybe the West Indies team is not doing so well, so the counties um, are not going to employ these players like they did before. But, you know, th that, was a, that was a time where the players needed the opportunity to play in different and changing conditions from day to day in order to help their game. I am sure that they use those times to, to visualize what it is about their game that needed to change. And they were able to make the changes, the adjustment to their game. So the county scene helped a lot of players, but it, it is quite disappointing now in that that doesn't happen anymore where the county seemed to have, to have, um, have not employed a lot of the players and so on. As I said, they may look at, well, who are we going to take? Yeah. They're not as many as they were before. And perhaps uh, the performance is not as great as those who were there before them. So, you know, they have their reasons. I don't know what it is, but the changing of the rules perhaps induced that those changes and those thinking with uh, the way it's happened in, in present day cricket. A lot has changed. So these days... Um... Happily retired. Um, what are you doing with yourself these days, Gordon? Are you enjoying life? Yes, I'm, I'm happily retired and I try to enjoy life. Um, um, I've had a couple of uh, events because um, there's a primary school in Barbados called the Gordon Greenish Primary School. It is um, situated in the area where I grew up before I came to England. And I've been trying to raise some funds for the school because um, the project I have in mind is to establish a library and a resource center at the school that would service the whole community. Right now we're using two 40 foot containers outfitted as the library, um, but we needed funds or we do need funds to expand on the area of the school that will house the library and the resource center. Uh, but we haven't been able to raise sufficient funds as yet for that. We need about $400,000, $450,000 to do all of that. And then we need to outfit it with the computers and things of that. So anyone out there who can help, yeah. I would appreciate. I'm also looking for books for the library. About myself, I 
2019, before this um, pandemic kicked in, uh, was not a great year for me in 2020. I had a triple bypass surgery the back end of June of that year. <clears throat> and in the, the October of the same year, I had prostate surgery. Oh. So um, in the last couple of years, it's been, uh, uh, I've been in the recovery stage and touch wood, um, my physicians are pleased with um, the outcome and there's some normality has um, has uh, 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 come back to me. So I, I'm just trying to enjoy love, life, and, and you know just take things easy. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy what is happening now with my life, and have it out in with my kids as well. My eldest boy, he has two two beautiful young girls who, who oh man, they are. <laughs> but let's put it this way: I was told a couple of years ago with when I was speaking to uh, a friend of mine who has grandchildren, and he said, if if that person knew that grandchildren were so nice, they would have had them first. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, um, we wish you well, and I uh, hope that your recovery continues to go superbly. Um, been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Gordon. Um, what is the name of your foundation? We're gonna push this and encourage people to support you. Well, it's the Gordon Grinnis um, Primary School Project. Okay. Incredible talking to you, and thank you for giving us some of your time today. And um, listen, let's catch up in uh, St. Peter uh, in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you. Take care. Okay. Okay.